This is Colossians 3, 22 through to 4, 1. So, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye, of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of hearts. Fearing the Lord, whatever you do, work heartedly as for the Lord and not for man, for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done and there is no partiality masters treat your bond servants justly and fairly knowing that you also have a master in heaven thank you <clears throat> okay in jesus christ's name father son and the holy spirit i pray for mike for this service this morning um, i just pray to god that um you speak through Mike, Jesus Christ. I pray that you touch our hearts. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you, Elliot. Friends, it is, it is good to see you. We've said it a few times. It's good to see so many visitors with us today as well. Um, <clears throat> and we've got a bit of a punchy text today. Um, just so you know, we've not dodged a verse, because if you were here last week you'll know we're in the stage of Colossians where we're speaking about relationships, household, household codes. And last week we spoke about husbands and wives. Naturally, in the order of the text, today, today would take us on to, um, to speaking about uh, children and parents. We're going to leave that for a separate time. Okay? It's not, that, it's not important. We're just going to leave it for a separate time. And so today, the relationship that we're going to be looking at, um, which is what our text is presenting us with, um, is one that actually will probably start a few mental gymnastics in people's minds. It's the one between slaves and, and slave masters. And I will pray for us in a minute. And I really do need the Holy Spirit to be with me today, friends, as we go through this one. But something just to... just, just you know, <laughs> I think we're all on the same page. This word, slavery, as we would understand it in the sense today, it is a word that rightfully stirs emotion and, and, and show it so it should. It's not hard to find graphic accounts and examples of slavery. Um, Zach, for example, this week, he, he's been on a road trip to, um, to the British Museum. There would have been boodles of stuff there at the museum, which which would have spoken into this. And, and probably one of the things which maybe many of us that are familiar with history books will be aware of will, will be the 16th to 19th century slave trade, which saw just innumerable people crammed, pushed, pulled onto boats, sent abroad, all to be exploited. And, and friends, that's wrong. That's completely wrong, um, which is why it's wonderful to see an individual like William Wilberforce, who interestingly was Christian, um, help around the abolition of that. And here's just two things before I pray, which is why slavery, and I, I just want to ex, really put the exclamation point on this before we start, why slavery as far as we would understand it by modern day context is just so wrong, okay? It is contrary to the biblical truth that all people, no matter who they are and where they're born and whatever they do in life, they have equal value, okay? Everybody whether they know God for who he is or not, they are equally made in the image of God. And the whole affair is obviously clearly contrary. If we think about um, passages of Scripture, the great commandment, what, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? And when Christ on to the, goes on to the second bit, he talks about how you should love your neighbour as yourself. Okay? Now, I could go into other passages of scripture to point out why slavery, as many think of it, is just so wrong. And God's word has lots to say on it. And you need to understand that. Because one of the things that we'll come to later on is this topic is one of the topics where people might almost like try and pull out rotten tomatoes, throw it at the Bible, and draw God's character into question. Just because God is talking about slavery in the Bible. Friends, context is key. Okay, context is really, really, really important. And if somebody wants to have an important conversation, you need to have a bit of time. And that's why I'm not going to rush through what we're doing this morning. This topic, um, all topic, topics in scripture are important. But for me to rush through this and without trying to be corny, but without doing it justice would not be right 
it would not be right. So apologies in advance if this takes five minutes or so longer than normal. It's just, it's just going to be as it's going to be. But here's a little seed just to plant for later on, okay? Throughout history, there have been times where people have willingly and voluntarily, consciously, with knowledge, enter into a long-term relationship of service with another party. That is fact, okay? And one of the reason beings for that would be things like trying to pay off a debt. Going bankrupt in the first century, it didn't exist. It was not possible. And the reason why I'm just planting that seed now is to really emphasize the point not all slavery is an identical copy and paste. The meanings of words change over the years. Context changes, okay? But often it's the latest understanding that, that sticks in our mind. But make no mistake, the context for this passage today is speaking about first century slavery, and that was tough. That was really, really tough. So let's just pray just for our time together. Um, Father, Father, I just pray just for each and every person in this room. Um, Father, we know that all scripture is profitable for teaching, for correction, for training. Um, Father, I just pray for just a work of the Spirit just to, just to let us see what we need to see inside this text, how we can apply it to our own lives, which might feel so, so distant. Father, let me um, emphasize what needs to be emphasized. But may people see the gospel. May people see Christ. And may people stand in faith and have trust in who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay. So, a little bit of an introduction before we get into our, into our text, because that wasn't the intro. Um, background to slavery in the Roman Empire. Okay, um, went on hundreds and hundreds of years, but first century, let's speak into our context, by, by conservative estimate, and this is conservative. At the time Paul, Paul wrote Colossians, at least 20% of the people living in the Roman Empire were slaves. That's conservative. If you want to go to the other end, you could actually be talking two-thirds. Many seem to meet in the middle on 50%. I've gone for conservative, just because that, that's what I can, I can see the... The evidence on, but, but here's something that's not hard to see. Becoming a slave was not something that people had a lot of choice about. Okay, now I've said there are people who would willingly enter into, into such an arrangement, and, and hopefully they had a much better master than, than many did. But here's the background to slavery many found themselves either born into slavery um, through their parent being a current slave, uh, others were sold into slavery after being either kidnapped. Or others are in the situation of slavery by being a conquest of war. So whichever way you look at those three entry routes, it's not enviable. And irrespective of those routes, there was an identical purpose upon slaves. Now, it might have played out differently in practice, and I'll speak into that in a moment. But fundamentally, slaves were there to perform their master's will. They were there to be constantly available... Also that the master's life would probably fall into the following three categories. It, the master would either be more comfortable. The master could be more indulgent or quite often wealthier. There were, for example, a lot of slaves who became slaves in mines. And that literally was a death sentence, pretty much. Not a lot came back from that at all. Now, the nitty gritty, obviously, the mining would be an extreme that we had. There were those who did things like household chores. There were other slaves, if they had the skills, they would maybe perform administrative tasks for the family. What you need to understand about the Roman cult, the Romans, if you're a Roman citizen, work wasn't really something you did, it was something other people did on your behalf. Even the running, even the running of your household. And, and things could get quite dark around that. I'm not going to say anything more than just what I'm about to say, because you can work to detach yourselves, but some slaves were even there just to meet their master's lusts, whatever those lusts were, okay? So you can see you've got a whole mixture of things that are going on. Um, by the time that Christ was born, the Roman Empire's strength and dominance, and this was largely, Ian spoke last week about the Greek influence, and the Greek influence is, is very much there, 
in the Roman Empire, but such was the might of Rome that the Roman Empire had even captured Jerusalem, Israel's key city. And at the top of the tree, fundamentally, from a ruling perspective, was Caesar. Okay? And being one of his people, a Roman citizen, was something that came with a degree of power. Okay? I've spoken a second ago about how Romans wouldn't work. They would get slaves to do it. But here's the power of being a Roman citizen, which has actually worked out in a good sense, in a profitable sense, actually, for, for the sharing of the gospel. Acts 22, 28. When he was about to be flogged by a centurion, the Apostle Paul pointed out he was a Roman citizen by birth. He hadn't brought his citizenship. He was a Roman citizen by birth. And here's what happened. That single profession of who he was led to those who are about to interrogate him withdrawing immediately and the whole tribune became afraid. Do you see? The power of being a Roman citizen. What's my point in all of this? Rome ruled. And if you're a Roman citizen, you ruled. And in practice, that meant you often ruled pridefully over your slaves. And the more slaves you had, normally the greater the social status that you would have in your household. And and this word slaves or or bond servants, as we see here, um, which in the original Greek is doulos, um, it basically meant you were all in, guys. Okay, this is, do not confuse a slave with being a servant. Okay, servants may be clocking at nine, they go home at five. Slaves, they stay where they are in whatever condition the master has afforded to them. And as Ian said last week, slaves are simply the possession of their master. That was the mindset, like a piece of household furniture. We spoke about Aristotle last week, the Greek philosopher, and we said Greek has influenced the Roman Empire. Well, according to Aristotle, slaves were nothing more than human tools and part of the natural order of the household. Some people fundamentally, according to this, they're just born to be slaves. It is just the way it is. And don't get me wrong, there were, there were ways that slaves could legitimately be free. Um, this was something called manumission. Um, But such was the life of a slave. Things like their opinions not mattering. Being able to be sold from one party to the next. I mean, this is is dehumanisation. Now, if there's been times where maybe someone's spoken to you harshly in your life and you think, that's really not treated me with the value that I should have. Friends, that was a fleeting season. Here, you're talking about slaves being dehumanized all over the place, okay? And that's why many tried to flee. Many did try to flee. And this brings me to a piece of evidence. I don't know, Zach, whether you did see it when when you were on your your trip this week. So in the British Museum, there is an artifact which dates back to the fourth century. Now, obviously, that's three centuries on from from our context, but the context is the same. It's a 15 centimeter wide plate. It resembles a dog collar, okay? It went around a slave's neck, And this is what the inscription on it read. Forgive me if this pronunciation is awful. I will give it as it is written, and then I will speak it in the English. Ten me now fusia, a revolcami ad dominium, ventinium in aria acalisti. In English, this is what it means. Hold me, lest I flee, and return me to my master, Venetius, on the estate of Callistus. There was no getting away. That's a human dog collar in the first centuries, many, many slaves, when they ran away and they were caught, they were branded on the head. Okay? Do you see being treated as a piece of property? Now, I don't know about you, who would want to see anything like that existing today? No one. Do you see? Do you see why I started the sermon in the te- in, in, like, as, as we did? Slavery by modern day con is wrong. That's horrific. Okay? Which brings us to um, two accusations against the Bible. And we don't dodge scripture, guys. Okay, we don't cherry pick to have an easy life. If you want to open up God's word, you have to sit there and you have to look at it and you have to pray and you have to look at all the context around it and think, what is this saying? But here's the two accusations. And 
these accusations, they're not presented as questions. They are very much presented as accusations. Okay? It's a loaded conversation from day one. And with the emotion, you can, you can understand why. So accusation number one. If slavery is so wrong, why doesn't the Bible, why doesn't God point blankly say, stop it? Second accusation, and why does God allow Israel in Old Testament times to have slaves? You see, two fundamental, it's there. One thing you're being accused of, which people are saying isn't in Scripture, which actually, interestingly, Paul, you'll see later on, does encourage freedom from slavery. Um, and the other thing about Old Testament Israel, and we'll come to that. Let me just address, address one of those to start off with, the very first accusation. Why doesn't God point blankly say, stop slavery? The Bible is not about instigating a political movement. Okay, it's, to, it's not to be a source document which is outlining various methods of social or economic reform. It's more. And this is what the gospel is. And hopefully you'll recognise this in your own lives. It's about having a new humanity. It's about having a new identity. It's about being transformed from the inside out. Things change when somebody has an encounter with Christ. And if there's anybody in this room that has not yet met Christ, you need to know that things will change when you come to meet Christ and you will feel something in here. We sung it earlier on, our King, Christ, Christ is the King. And we'll come into that a little bit later. And all of this is through grace. It is a grace gift. So that's the individual. So you know, how, how do we get towards having this, this kind of almost like taste of heaven here? Well, Alexandra McLaren, a Scottish Baptist who lived some time ago, says as follows, and I'm going to read this carefully because I don't want to misquote the guy because I think he spent, I think he was really on it when he, when he was saying this. First, the message of Christianity is primarily to individuals and only secondarily to society which makes sense because it's people that make up society. It leaves the units, the people, whom it is influenced, touched, to influence the mass. Second, it acts on spiritual and moral sentiment, and only afterwards and consequentially on deeds or institutions. Well, if we think about what we think about having a heart that's warm for God, things flow out of that. They come later on. Third, it hates violence and trusts wholly to enlightened conscience with knowledge. It's really interesting. In our text today, which I will get to, there's instances here It's that you know, you know, you know. There is something you know about your lives and about who Christ is. Now, we can wrestle against that at various times, but we know who Christ is. And this was really how McLaren summarised it. So it, the gospel, meddles directly with no political or social arrangements, but it lays down principles which will profoundly affect these and leaves them to soak in the general mind. In other words, the gospel changes people. William Wilberforce, what did he help do? Helped abolish. So like, do you see? Here's the bottom line. If everybody alive in this world today knew Christ, any remaining slavery, and by estimation there's about 23 million slaves still in the world, you can include all sorts of slavery, sex trade, things like that, it would all end. Slavery would end. World wars would end. Look at the news this week. Drug dealing on street corners would end. The way, the aggressive ways we treat each other at times will end. And that's exactly why Paul does not need to say stop slavery. Although he does encourage freedom from it, wherever possible. Here's what he does need to be about. Because you always get this, this is what flee and pursue. This is, this is what Paul does need to be about. Paul needs to be about preaching the gospel. 
He needs to be about exhorting people about who they are in the gospel, no matter what situation in life they find themselves in. Because ultimately, your value is not defined by any type of worldly accomplishment or how this world treats you. If you are in Christ, your identity is defined by Christ. And Christians are called to be radically different. One of the things we sung earlier on, we are here for you. Not for ourselves. And that is a total shift which goes on up here. And the gospel is there for everybody in this room, even if you've not yet accepted it. And it was also there for slave masters. Paul is writing this letter to the church. Okay? He's addressing slaves and slave masters, which means in the congregation there would be some people who were slave masters. Okay? I can't go into this one, but I just want to give you some context, yeah? Don't put anybody on a pedestal. Jonathan Edwards, many of you will know about him, he had slaves. That's all I'm going to say about that, okay? Don't expect perfection in a Christian, but expect character change over over the long term. And no one can judge how, no one knows how he treated his slaves. He might have treated them very godly, okay? We don't dodge facts. We're here to look at what we can take from the text. And remember, the bigger the sinner... When we talk about slave masters, horrendous slave masters, as if such a thing as the biggest sinner ever really exists, the bigger the sinner, the more glory to God when a life is transformed. The darker any of your individual backgrounds, any of our backgrounds, the things which maybe we think, no, I'm not sharing that, I'm not talking about that, friends, Christ and the gospel will liberate you from all of that. Christ is the key to this padlock which exists over so many people's lives. And here's something which maybe for the slaves in, um, in Colossians, here's something which maybe Paul's words might have done to them, deeply encouraging. Can you imagine how hearing Paul's message, I mean, he's talking here about inheritance, okay? By worldly standards, slaves don't get an inheritance, But he's talking here about inheritance and how your Christs, these are people who would have felt like they were nothing, who had had their self-worth removed. But in effect, what Paul's saying to them is just like other people around you, you are more than you are more than in as being part of of the church he's basically affirming that these slaves who might have felt like nothing they basically have rational um, you know they are rational moral beings who are capable of having a deep relationship with Christ how different is that to any relationship with maybe their earthly slave their earthly slave masters so I'm really going to start working through these verses but what's really you know Hopefully nobody in this room is a slave in the context or a slave master in the context of anything like we've spoken about in the horrors of the first century, okay? So how do we take this and apply it to us? Three things. Firstly, we let it tell us about God to help build our faith and our trust in God. We let the scripture tell us about character, godly character of what it means to be in Christ, and God's always more concerned longer term about character than he is temporary comfort. And finally, we let the gospel, the message to those who were basically more oppressed than maybe we could possibly dare to imagine, speak to us about those moments of times when somebody does have a position of power and authority upon us. Number one example, employment. Somebody has power and authority over you and they can tell you what to do whether you like it or not Um, and it's all about us it's easy to think about them this part of Colossians friends it is not a duvet day text it is about work ethic but by the time we've gone through it hopefully you'll see the gospel well and truly at play in the middle of it that's the introduction okay 
Verse number 22, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Just last week, as we heard about obedience, and when we think about parents and children, we would hear about obedience. Paul is addressing the slaves, and he's talking about obedience to their masters. But I just want to pick up just on one thing, this word, everything. There is a message ingrained across scripture, which isn't expressly stated here, but you need to understand. It's an overriding condition. Everything never means do anything ungodly. As God's children, we do not do, or we do not seek to do ungodly things. Obedience never means proactively and consciously doing something that is wrong by God's word. But we do need to be committed to what the gospel calls us towards. And there is a pattern across the whole of the New Testament which speaks about work ethic. I'm not going to unpack every single verse, okay? Let's think about thieves. Go to work. Be a blessing for other people. Christians, maybe, who think the end times have already come, who are relying on the generosity of the Christians around them. You don't work, you don't eat. Do you see? Verses like this, work ethic ethic are there in the new testament it's also there in the old testament in genesis man is given a job to do to look after creation yeah probably not doing a great job on that one we can all take our eyes off the task at hand sometimes friend colossian or sorry first corinthians ten thirty one. so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do do all to the glory of god it includes the workplace the workplace is probably the single biggest place outside of our own home where we actually spend our time during the course of the week, which means it's the biggest place where we can be a witness for Christ. If God has saved you, you're a light. And that means something. It means your actions count, your decision-making counts, your motivations count, and God will weigh all things. We will come to that a little bit later. Fundamentally, we are here for you. And outworking of that is to give others a taste of who God is. And here's the danger of consciously pursuing ungodly action. Actually saying, I know what you've said, but no. It's potentially hardening to the new heart that God has put inside you. By grace... It's contrary to the leading of the Holy Spirit. There are times, I'm sure, in our lives, so I know I have, where we've maybe felt uncomfortable when we've said no and not done something when maybe we should have. But ungodliness, it has another cost beyond all of that. It has reputational cost. And ultimately, the reputation on the line is Christ's. We profess to be Christians. I'm here talking about the global church, not here, but we're part of the global church. We profess to be Christians. Do we look different to what's experienced in the world? By the way that we think, by the way we react. All Christians, no matter where they sit this morning in whatever church, we should all want two things. And there will be people, for example, still in places like India. Like we talk about household codes for here. India, the caste system, we've been there. Like people will say it doesn't exist. It does still exist in practice. You see it. You can... You can you can talk to people, but we should all want two things if we're in Christ. We should want our will and our mindset to be aligned to what God wants for our lives. And we should want our actions to show he matters more than anything this world can throw at you. Mark eight thirty six. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Our treasure is Christ. An earthly master, as Paul calls slave masters here, always has the right to issue orders, 
But make no mistake, nobody who is breathing on this planet, their authority does not trump God. Not even Caesar's in the first century. But here's the flip side of the coin, which is kind of rubs against that maybe like entitlement culture, which seems to have spread a bit in recent decades. Friends, even if you're not given your perfect job to do, and you feel there's bits of it which just, it's just not me. If it's godly work, your employer can expect productivity from you. You are to approach, as our text says, your work with sincerity and heartfeltedly. This is all, please, if we've got a long-term illness, I'm not talking about that, okay? When I'm talking about work ethic, we have to accept, okay, not everything is as it should be, but no child of God from an attitude perspective should be content with brushing things under the carpet. We approach our tasks like Christ approached his mission, his ministry in this world. Not for one minute. There were times when he had to go to the Father for strengthening, but not for one minute did he lose sight of what he was there to do. And Paul speaks here about uh, eye, eye pleasers, people pleasers. I felt convicted as I was prepping for this today. I know there's been times where I've started tapping the keyboard just as like the boss walks around the back and just thinking, well, you know, it's not about trying to big our ego up, guys. We've got an identity in Christ which surpasses everything. And this sincerity that our text talks about, performing tasks laid before us, sincerity in reality, what it means here is single-mindedness. For one single purpose, for the love of God, for the glorification of of God, not that we can make him any more glorious, but we're making him known by our actions. Have any of you ever, for example, um, in any walk, could be sports, whatever, but have you ever looked at somebody and just thought, how can they do that? Like, how are they capable of doing that? Well, the types of thoughts Christian work ethic should produce in the workplace should be thoughts like, why do they care so much? Why are they so consistent? Why are they even coming back when they've done what I've asked them to do and say, is there anything else I can do? What is it that makes them tick? And there's the being a witness for Christ, no matter where you are. Titus 2, verses 9 to 10, says as follows. Bond servants are to be submissive to their masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Saviour. The doctrine of God. There is something about how we are in this world which reveals something about the doctrine of God, our saviour. And let's just think about our saviour as we should each and every time we come and gather. John 17 verse 4, when addressing the father and before going to the cross for all of our benefit, Christ says as follows, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Humble work, at times torturous work, but also that believers in him could finally look forward to something spectacular. That which is truly life. Friends, I don't know the component parts of all of your life, but as somebody who only came to faith at age 42, life is infinitely better with Christ than without Christ. And somehow you know you're here for him. And this is the situation which is being addressed today. But verse number, verse number 23, interesting point in our text. Um, so Paul's speaking about the slave master's position in a slave's life. In the Greek, he actually uses the word kurios. So we spoke about doulos, slave, early on here we've got kurios. For those of you who 
no Greek. There's somebody else who the word kurios is used for. Christ. Paul is not for a moment saying the two are equal. You have no rival. You have no equal. We sung it earlier on. It'd be lunacy for him to say the two are the same. And that's why he clarifies he's talking about earthly masters. Masters in the flesh would probably be a better way of looking at it. But what Paul's doing is he's pointing to a level, a position of authority that cannot be ignored. It's real. The gospel has not come to incite civil rebellion. Let's go to that maximum where we said maybe two-thirds of the Roman Empire. Can you imagine yeah, the civil rebellion? But let's think about what we've also heard as well about that long-term character change, which goes on. And as we are becoming more like Christ, our what's called fear of the Lord, that changes. Everybody in this world should have a fear of the Lord, if they knew who he was. But our fear of the Lord, and we, we did some of this a couple of weeks ago in Psalm 67, we should not fear God like an abusive father. God provides. We'll come on to what we're provided with in Christ in a few moments because we have much to be grateful for, but God sees all. We spoke about motivations earlier on that sit behind things. God sees all. He is sovereign. He can bring the power of any earthly authority or social structure to an end just like that. Go and ask a man called Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 4. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. He learned through that. He came to have a much better understanding of who God is. And one day we will all give an account for our life. We will all give an account, even for the works we've done since we've come to faith in Christ. So what should we do when the going gets tough and we think this being godly business just feels a little bit, a little bit different? We look for our strengthening from God, the only person who can give it to us. Verse 23 says, whatever you do, work heartily. Work heartily. Easy to think, isn't it? Just, oh, I'm just going to give it. I'm just going to give it some. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, talks about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. When it's talking here about heartily, it is speaking about soul service, if such a word exists here. It's with everything you've got. What God's hand has let come into your life, give it everything you've got, unless it's ungodly. You don't go near that. And towards the end of verse 24, there's literally words here which would blow the whole worldly slavery picture apart. But the whole of verse 24 speaks into this. Knowing that from the Lord you'll receive an inheritance, your faithfulness will be rewarded. There's an inheritance that will come to all of us. We get to be co-heirs with Christ. That's not really what this script, like when you look at the earlier passages in Colossians is talking about, your inheritance is your hope. 
Your inheritance is your eternal hope. Now, there is actually the possibility as well that this is talking about individual rewards for staying faithful under pressure, for working heartily, for having that sincerity. You get a roll call, don't you, of faithful people. You see that in the New Testament. But we all have to give an account. We all have to give an account. And anything that is done with ungodly motive, even though it might look right, even though we're already Christian, don't expect a reward for that if there's individual rewards. Those types of works, they will be burned up. They won't, the only thing which is going to last for eternity is righteous, righteousness. Nothing unrighteous qualifies anybody who's righteous through Christ for anything. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 21 to 23. Were you a bond servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bond servant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, who was free when called is a bond servant of Christ. You were brought with a price. Do not become bond servants of men. Earlier on, I mentioned about this how if someone was in this long-term relationship, how they could be sold from here to here. You've been brought with a price, not by a horrific earthly transaction, but by a divine heavenly transaction. You've been brought with a price. You are Christ's. Okay? And any unrighteousness, any ungodliness that does creep in, Friends, the blood of Christ has paid for it all. If you are truly Christ's, you have an assurance, a hope, an inheritance that cannot be taken away from you. But if you find yourself in a, dece- a season of despair when you feel yourself struggling, please just do remember it is the same grace that will see you home that has saved you. Yeah? Yeah? The Christian life isn't about being perfect in this world. It's about seeking to be like Christ. And it's about waging war against sin in your life. There will be moments where we will all need strengthening. And it's on that particular part of of where we are. I just want to talk about something which might shock a number of people. Because it's easy to sit here and thinking, slavery, that doesn't exist today. Every person alive in the world who does not know God is a slave. They are a slave of sin. Do you remember we spoke about that death sentence of going to the mines earlier on? Here's some of the things that scripture says about sin and its weight in eternal matters. John 8, 34, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Don't confuse practice with one-off slip, okay? Practice, ongoing, regular behavior, because it's showing no change of heart in here. You'll be known by your fruit. Ezekiel 18.4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul who sins shall die. But... Romans 6. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. Freedom in Christ and I talk about how good God is as your master, how Christ is as your master in a second, if you're saved saved from something, that gives you another reality. It's not like saved from this, void. 
You're either here or you're here. You're a slave to sin or actually you're Christ's. Mm. And friends, you're Christ's. Romans, again, 6, verse 22. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Even before you knew Christ as your true master, he was planning your prosperity. Not horrors for you, your prosperity. So Christ says, I go to prepare rooms for you. Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Wage war against your sin. Verse 25, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. It's easy to think in the context of this when we're thinking payback, wrongdoing. We're talking here just about slave masters. That's not the intention of the text. We've gone from a position of talking about reward. This is now the contrast. We've gone for reward, for righteous works, godly works, to ungodliness that we have got. We've already said, when it comes to matters eternal, the works that are done with an ungodly godly motivation they do not count they will not qualify for a reward okay but whilst you're here in this world do remember the lord disciplines those he loves hebrews 12 6 god is not uninterested in your life but he loves you he disciplines those he loves Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This is reality. This is punching home. Knowing, same way you know, slave masters, knowing you have a master in heaven, this is an all-out attack on the head of the Roman household being sovereign. There is only one sovereign who exists, and it's God. Everybody else is subordinate to him. Earthly rulers, subordinate. Awful bosses, subordinate. You could go on with that list. For those of you who were here last week, Ian drew something on a whiteboard. Who was at the top of the list on the whiteboard? Different people or beings were drawn on that board. What was the order? Can you remember? God, man, woman, underneath creation if god is in the right position in your life this will start making more sense when you read it if you are seeking the work of god in your life the message of this you will actually think hang on a minute i can think i kind of can see what is going on here now i want to talk a little bit about god's character because it's we know here Justly and fairly. We know that about God, right? He's just. He's fair. He's perfect in righteousness. And the good news is he never changes. Here's the picture of slavery in the Old Testament, in Israel. Remember I said two accusations earlier on. Let's see what this tells us about the character of God. Because it was different. And just so you know, slavery existed before the Ten Commandments were given. Okay? Okay? God doesn't speak normally to say, this is all going really well, guys. Keep on doing this. God speaks when things are going wrong in the world and he speaks for the attention of man to listen. If anybody in Israel dared to take a slave who had been kidnapped, it was capital punishment. The slave master could be killed. Slaves were also allowed to take, a, whilst in, in captivity, if you want to look at that, they were allowed to take a wife. They were allowed to have a family. They were allowed not to be sold to foreigners. They had the right to be adopted into the family by marriage. They had the right to food 
and clothing. An Israel slave master, the picture's meant to be very different. It's a picture of provision. Providing in godly ways. Now, I'm not going to say they were all perfect. Okay? God has to do that work in people's hand. Or in people's lives, rather. And Israel masters could take Israel slaves captive. It was discouraged. It was discouraged, okay? That wasn't the norm. You have this picture here of you're free. God's people are free. You're not being taken in slavery. But, 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 there was something called indentured servitude, okay? And what that meant was that if somebody's life really got into a pickle, they could go to one of their equal tribe and say, I really need your help. Leviticus 25, verse number 39 and 40. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and a sojourner. There was also the right to be released after six years of service. And when it came to release, Deuteronomy 15, verses 13 and 14, says as follows. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press, as the Lord your God has blessed you you shall give to him. That's a bit more than having a rubbish state pension when you come out of service, guys, isn't it? You're called to bless those who even come to you and ask for your help. It's always about heart. Hopefully you can see the difference there between what God was calling his people to versus those horrors in the first century. But all mankind, we all need God's help to be anything like Christ. Look at the Ten Commandments. No killing, no stealing, no lying. No other gods. No other sovereign master. Christ and Christ alone. Towards the back of the Bible, and we're pushing into, pushing into our clothes here. Um, you see one of Paul's other letters, um, the letter to Philemon. So if you've not read it yet, so the context is Philemon has somebody in his house serving a long time. And if I can never pronounce it, once it for us. Anesimus, thank you. Thank you, my dear brother. Yeah. Um, he, runs a, he, he runs away because he's stolen something. He meets Paul. And he becomes converted. Paul writes to Philemon. And he asks him to receive him back as a brother in the faith. And he even says, I'll pay his debt. Receive him back as a brother in the faith. Do you see this picture of reconciliation amongst God's people? Now, it's easy to think about this is all today about work. But we've kind of touched on there how God's people treat each other and are meant to treat each other. How do you value those sat around you? Your brothers and sisters in Christ. In an hour of need, will you be there for them? When they need support, will you be there for them? Will you be a blessing in their life? Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ. And that's who you are. If you have put your faith in Christ, you have got a loving master who will provide for you, for your eternity, who will bless you. You are co-heirs in what Christ gets. But please make your time here count. In Jesus' name we pray.
Father, Father, I just lift up these dear brothers and sisters here. I thank, thank you for their patience as this probably went on longer than initially envisaged. Father, I just pray somehow the message of the gospel has got home inside of that. And if there's anybody here who needs to know more about Christ, this loving master who wants good things for their life, please may they come and speak to us.